Welcome back to your new favorite TV show. I do not think that means what you think it means. And our contestants are battling for a prize worth millions. You all know it. <gasps> Truth. That's right. We have our contestants misunderstood, <laughs> misdirected, and Bob. Sup? So. All right. Our first question. Daniel was nearly eaten by what feline? It's a lion, right? You got it. Question two. This little light of mine. What do I do? Let it shine, let it shine. <laughs> oh, uh, no, oh, don't let Satan it out. Right. Yeah, no. Correct. Uh, now for our final question worth double the points. Why do we gather together every week to worship God? I got this one. It's because God is a cosmic killjoy who doesn't understand that I work 80 hours a week. No, because worship is our service to God. He No, he needs our prayers. What, because he'll disappear if we don't sing some songs? Technically, we don't even have to go to worship at all. Wait, are you saying there's a loophole no, on okay, this worship No, okay, don't get thing? him started. He's got a full agenda right, of things over uh, Oh, thank goodness it's time for a commercial. Uh, thanks for tuning in to I Do Not Think That Means What You Think It Means. I need a raise, please. I think Pat Finder does deserve a raise. Uh, you think we should make that happen? All in favor? All right, good. But why do we go to church? Why do you worship? Our three friends are discussing a really important question, one that we have often asked ourselves, each and every one of us, and one that we really begin to ask at an early age. I can remember as a kid feeling like my parents forced me to go to church, and I was like, why? Now, we have a lot of kids in here today. Kids, where you at in the crowd? You guys have it so good, all right? Now, when, when I was younger, when a lot of people in here were younger, they did not have kids ministry. Uh, they, did, they didn't have amazing worship experiences like this. A lot of churches didn't. Uh, kids were expected to sit quietly for that, that full hour, you know? We couldn't make our brothers laugh, couldn't crawl under the pew in front of you, you know? Uh, nobody had a phone or an iPad to play with, and, and our kids' packs didn't have near all the cool stuff uh, that they do here. Uh, show of hands, who ended up getting a kids' pack? Where are you at, kids? Yep, yep, I see, yeah, lots of them. Great, uh, nice work, you know, and know that it's okay to share with your parents, too, uh, because parents can suffer from a little boredom as well. In fact, I remember as a kid going to church, my dad, he, you know, to pass the time, he would be looking at his watch a lot, but he had a little bit of a secret. His watch was special. On his watch, you could play the game Frogger. And uh, this is the game where you have to help the frog cross the street, you know, without getting smashed. And, uh, you know, so my dad, that's how he would keep from getting bored in church is he would try and avoid getting caught playing Frogger. <laughs> And there's just times where worship can be boring. Um, not here at Pathfinder, mind you. I'm sure none of us feel that ever. Um, but there's times when we just don't feel jazzed to head into worship. But we still come because we, we feel or we pass on some sort of, of obligation as if we're expected by God to be in the pew, that, that we should make whatever sacrifice is necessary to be here because it's what we should do and it makes sense. God happy. In fact, our, our Catholic friends, they even label certain worship services as being so important to show up for that they're called days of obligation. Just straight up, call it what it is. Your sacrifice required on these days. And that's how many of us think about church. But the, the question that Pat Finder raised is really important. Why? Why do we gather together to worship God? Why do we feel this obligation to occupy the pew? 
Where do we get this idea from? And does it come from God's word or not? Will it check out? That's what we've been exploring in this series. All these misconceptions around common passages of scripture and the ways that we get them wrong at times. And today, the passage today is really important. Um, it's a big deal because kids, sooner or later, kids, you're going to grow up and move out of the house, your, your parents hope, and you're going to make your own choices about church and worship. And for all of us of all ages, relational and societal pressure is only so motivating. It can only get us to do so much. There must be a bigger why behind why we worship right? That, that isn't, and if it isn't based on what is true, on what scripture actually says, then I don't want it. I don't want it for me. I, I don't want it for you because bad theology hurts people. It diverts us. It gets us lost. It gets us off track of the journey of finding whole life in Jesus. And let me be clear. Today's passage, it is so good but also so misunderstood. So we're gonna dig into it. And here's where it comes from. It comes from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament from Hebrews 13, really short. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Now there's something about the word sacrifice of praise and, and how they hit us. And it kind of makes sense with, with what we think. We're, we're used to this idea that we, we have an amazing, holy, transcendent God. That we have a God who created all things. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. Uh, he's eternal, right? He, he, he's the one who gave us the gift of life, and he sustains this broken, word, uh, broken world by his power uh, and, and redeems our brokenness through the work of Jesus. And so it makes total sense to us that he is worthy of our worship, that he deserves our praise. And in fact, a big part of the Old Testament is telling people just how you are to worship a king, the Lord of lords, someone who holds your very fate in his hands. And You know, the first five books of the Bible, they're called the Torah, the Pentateuch. And if you to dig into those, what you find is that there's a whole lot of detailed instructions on how to offer sacrifices that people should bring to worship God. And it's a very foreign concept to us. But God, when he brought Israel into the common land, he had them adopt what was a common practice among the people there, and that was using animal sacrifice as a part of worship. And so, you know, it would be lambs and goats and rams and doves, and there were all sort of stipulations on how to make different types of sacrifices. But regardless, the the animals that you brought were were supposed to be free of blemish. They they shouldn't be lame or sickly. Uh, They should be spotless. And, And, you know, it stipulated how much each person was obliged to give, Sometimes it had various requirements to accommodate those who were rich or those who were poor. But overall, the thought was that getting right with God, it required something. It cost you something. It required sacrificing something over to God. And even if you're not an Old Testament expert, you probably have some sense that that's what they were doing back then. And it also kind of checks out with our own life experience, right? I knew as a young person, as a kid, that if I wanted to make my mom happy, I needed to get her a Diet Coke. And I needed to get her, you know, go through the drive through at McDonald's and get her the biggest one that's sold, all right? And that would make her happy. Um, also, you know, I remember a, a trip that we took to China. So some of you guys know, some of my siblings are adopted from China. And I got to go with my mom on one of those trips and pick up one of my siblings. And we, in preparation for the trip, we had to bring all of these items as gifts for the various officials that we would be meeting. And, and they sort of amount to what I would consider a bribe, but it's not the way they looked at it. They, they looked at it as a, a gift that you did to honor those who were in authority that you would be meeting. And since we didn't want to commit any social faux pas, we wanted them to do what we wanted them to do for us. And so we would bring them 
these gifts. We paid the piper. So, you know, in the New Testament, when in the book of Hebrews, we hear that we should offer a sacrifice of praise, it's easy to draw some of the same conclusions that we have an obligation to worship God. And that worship by, by very definition and by nature is sacrificial. That it's bringing something of ours to God that he might receive his due. And, and not just anything, it would be bringing our best to him. And, and so we dutifully wake up and we, instead of hitting the links with Bob, we, we show up for worship. In many traditions, people dress up in their Sunday best, right? And we hope that our presence, our passionate singing, our earnest prayers will be pleasing to God. We emphasize that baptism is how you show God that you're all in and tithing is how you continue to prove it. And it's easy to think that all of this is just kind of like putting points in the bank of God, you know, a bit of cosmic bartering, if you will, to, to, to sac our sacrifice in exchange for God's blessings. And that's something that can lead to a bit of resentment on our part. When we think that God isn't seeming to honor the, the points balance that we've accumulated, you know, when hardship comes our way, it's so easy to think, why, God, why did, why did you let this happen? Haven't I given you everything that you want from me? Now, my, my children are at an age where they're very reward motivated. And so they've been doing chores and, uh, you know, they even, being the industrious children that they are, uh, sometimes will try and anticipate or dream up chores that they could do to put more in their coin jars. And so they'll come to us and say, hey, can I get paid to do this? And, and sometimes, you know, that's helpful. Other times we're like, Wow, that, that wouldn't even help us at all. That's not something I need you to do. And, and yet here you are try, expecting to get paid for it. And when it comes to worship, I think, are we really giving God something that he needs? I mean, he's God. Isn't he self-sustaining, self-fellowshipping? You know, what could he possibly need that he can't snap his fingers and, or utter and, and get He's the God that made the universe. He's the God uh, that created all things, that put the stars each in their unique spot in the cosmos and, and all the planets and astrological bodies. And it's mind-blowing to think about how big it all is. He's the God who made the dinosaurs. I mean, uh, kids, where are you at? Check back in with me, kids, here. Um, now, kids always know the answer to this question. What is your favorite dinosaur? Just shout it out if you got it. What's your favorite dinosaur? Tyrannosaurus, T-Rex. Okay, we got a lot of different types. Uh, now, if my kids were at this service, they would want me to, to say Parasaurophilus. And I'm like, Parasaurophilus? Like, you can't even remember to put pants on and you can spell and somehow articulate Parasaurophilus. But I love it, kids, that you guys, you guys know so much about God's gift of creation and, and therefore also about the, mo the amazing awesomeness of our God, our God who has legions of angels at his disposal. This is who we worship. And yet when we come to worship, we imagine that we're doing something for him, right? And sometimes the way we talk about our need to, to praise God or to demonstrate our faith in God through worship, it almost makes God out as if he has this insecure ego that, that needs to be stroked and appeased. And, and that's certainly what we think and certainly how he comes off in the story of Abraham. Abraham lived over 4,000 years ago and God told him to, to climb up a mountain and sacrifice his son, Isaac. And as we read this story, you know, that's something that some of the, the false gods in Canaan at the time would require, particularly a god named Moloch, uh, you know, and some people did sacrifice their kids to these false gods. It's a horrible thought, and we are meant to, to ponder it. You know, it, it makes us think of this, this core question this story does. 
what sort of God are we dealing with here? What, what sort of God do we have? Do we have a God who demands our sacrifice in exchange for his blessings? Do we have a, a God who needs our time, our money, our, our volunteerism, our praise, our blood, our children in order to be pleased with us? Uh, this is what we and Abraham are meant to ponder as the, the story unravels. And long story short, we get to the end. And at the end, God stops Abraham uh, and he says, stop. I will provide the sacrifice. Abraham doesn't need to, to sacrifice Isaac. God is like no other. God himself is the one who makes satisfaction for the brokenness of humanity. And he does it himself. This is why he sent Jesus, not to get us back on track, to show us, you know, here's how you can get back to offering sacrifices that God is really happy with. You know what? That never really worked to begin with. But God sent Jesus in order to be the sacrifice, in order that through him we might receive blessing from God, not as a barter, but on faith, as a gift. That God isn't pleased with us because of how many times we've checked in to the pew or how passionately we've sung but through Jesus. That's what the words of the passage say. They begin with through Jesus. And everything after that assumes a foundation of through Jesus. The rest of this is true. It is through Jesus on the account of, in the name of, and for the sake of Jesus that God is pleased with you. God is pleased with you. And it's through Jesus that we finally get it. That God is not emotionally unstable. He doesn't call us to, to worship in order to appease his own ego or needs. The truth is from us, God requires no appeasement. Say this with me. Try it on for size. God requires no appeasement. Really, truly. Don't add to it no appeasement. Now this is hard to fathom. It's counter everything that we've been taught. Uh, it's really hard to wrap our minds around. And as I was sitting at my desk, I'm writing this message, I'm writing this point, And even I'm, I'm going, is that true? Can I really 100% say that? There's this part of me that wants to push back against it. There always has been that part of me and probably a part of many of us. I don't, I don't know about you, but I think my whole life there's been a part of me been trying to, to make God happy, obeying all the rules, going to church, doing daily devotions, holding the door open, uh, volunteering, sharing, being nice to others, right? It's exhausting. Uh, but part of me thinks God surely must be pleased with, with these things because of he must be that, he must be pleased with me. And at first, our passage for today, Hebrews 13, 15, it seems to confirm that God needs these sort of sacrifices of praise. But when we zoom out and we take the whole context of Scripture in mind, we learn that it's actually quite the opposite. This is Psalm 51. This is David speaking. He's speaking to God, and he says, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. And we're like, what? Like, this is the Old Testament? And David's saying this? You don't delight in sacrifice? God does not delight in sacrifice, in bloodshed, or in anything that people offer to try to win his favor. He doesn't now, and he never has. All those sacrifices in the Old Testament, all those stipulations for worship, they weren't to earn anything with God as if the blood of, of lambs or, or bulls could earn forgiveness for us. And when we read the words sacrifice of praise, we shouldn't read them then as, as going, you know what, you better, better get to church. You know, we shouldn't read those words as God going, like I see you, even up in the balcony, you know, the, the, I've seen what you've, you've been up to. You better get to church and you better offer a sacrifice to God and it had better be good and worth it 
But instead, as as we read these words, we should read them much more in the context of someone who's lived under the Old Testament sacrificial system. Someone who's been bringing these blood sacrifices uh, over and over again throughout their lives. And now to be told, the sacrifice you have to give is a sacrifice of praise. You'd be thinking, well, that, that doesn't cost me anything. This is amazing. This is totally freeing. No longer do I have to bring these animals and shed their blood. I just get to offer a sacrifice of praise. And this passage, instead of, of reinforcing worship as, as sacrifice and obligation, as it's so often been used, it instead says that we have now been unburdened from this false pursuit of appeasement. The Pharisees, they were all about trying to make God happy and and through their, their false teachings, they tied up lots of heavy regulations and put them on the common people and they were unable to, to bear them all. And Jesus would chastise them regularly. But then Jesus, speaking of his own teachings, he says this, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Say that with me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, see, Jesus comes to us in love. He loves you. He cares for you. He is with you and his favor is fully upon you. In Jesus, the jar is full. You have nothing left to prove. But then it's fair to wonder, okay, why then, if we have nothing left to prove, why then does God, throughout Scripture, call us to worship? Why does he ask us to come together in his name, to to sing his praises? Why are there even parts of Scripture where God says that he is pleased with that? Because he wants the best for us. He absolutely wants the best for us. And worship is the best thing that can happen to us. You see, we, we've been getting the emphasis all backwards. If we were to think about these words that we say so often, are you going to the worship service? We think of the worship as where we serve God, but it's totally backwards. Worship is where God calls us together in order to serve us. In actuality, it's where God is the one coming to us to bless us. And primarily today, I want us to think about how he blesses us in worship in two ways, two big ways. And the first one is this, that worship is covenant renewal. Now this word covenant, it's kind of an old fashioned word, but it means promise or an agreement that sets the terms of a relationship. And a a covenant is a word that was used heavily in the Old Testament. Uh, God made a covenant with his people, with Israel. He would, you know, call them to be his people and he'll, he'll be their God. And it was kind of a great deal. Only the Israelites were never really able to uphold their end of the bargain. They always fell short. They were always trying to find identity and security and meaning through the worship of other things and gods. And we have some of those same temptations in our own lives. But it wasn't working out. And so God spoke through one of his prophets, through Jeremiah, and he said this. He said, I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, no, the Lord. Because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is what constitutes the new covenant that God brings us in Jesus. It is remembering our sins no more. 
And when we gather for worship together, we're gathering to be renewed in our relationship with God under the new covenant, a covenant of grace that does not depend on our obedience, but rather on the mercy of God for you and for me in Jesus. That's why at the Last Supper, the words of Jesus that that we hear every time we take communion, he says, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you. This is the new promise shed for you. When we gather, when we sing, when we pray, commune, we're coming together as believers to be reoriented as God's children and covenant people. We're coming into relationship with God, our our maker and redeemer, because relationship with him is, is the best possible thing we can have because he is so good to us. He is a giver. He gives us this new covenant. And he also gives us the second thing I want us to remember uh, about how God pours grace into us in worship. He gives us this means of grace. He he knows that we are tangible, embodied people uh, and we need to interact with his grace physically. Uh, And so he gives us two things that the means of grace represents. He gives us his word and his sacraments. His word and sacrament as gifts. He wants us to open them, uh, to receive them and cherish them. Now, for so long in worship, I came as an observer or or a box checker uh, going through the motions. And maybe you have too. So don't miss this. Don't miss the benefit that in worship, God has something for you and for me and for humanity that you can't get from anyone else. In the gift of God's word, just think about how amazing this is, that, that we do not have to wonder where the world came from, how it was made. We don't have to wonder what God is like, why there is pain and evil and suffering, or how to live a meaningful whole life. Scripture tells us that, that we find that through worship of the Father, this Jesus, his Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. We don't have to come up with our morality and ethics from scratch. God guides us through living a life to the full in his word, right? It's an incredible treasure. And so too are the sacraments, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. A sacrament is a promise of God, a gift to God attached to a physical element since we are, are those embodied people that he has created. And we get to interact with his grace in tangible ways through baptism and the Lord's Supper. In baptism, God brings us into the family of God. He cleanses us. He puts his full favor upon us. Uh, and in communion, we receive the gift of grace won for us by Jesus at the cross, anew and afresh to be renewed in it all the time. The same grace by which Jesus has saved us, we receive. And you know what? We keep trying to make worship about what we give to God because you know what? That's just kind of the way the the world works. That's what we're used to. You scratch my back, I'll I'll scratch yours. You know, you do me a favor, I'll, I'll return it. We even have these words, I owe you one. And this was kind of the rub for me. This gave me a lot of heartburn and a lot of insecurity. You know, when my daughter was diagnosed with cancer last year, um, she's she's doing great now. But when she was diagnosed, we had been here for three months. We were brand new. Had just uprooted the family. We were just building some relationships in this place and getting to know this community. We didn't have any time to to put some chips in the relational bank, to to serve others so that that when we needed it, um, you know, we we had that to draw from. And so essentially we were coming into a situation where uh, with her diagnosis, I knew that I was gonna have to cash out a ton of of favors, but I hadn't put anything in, any chips in the bank to draw from. And, and, you know, that made me very apologetic and so forth and, and made me worry a lot. And then finally, God just had to speak to me throughout this whole process and go to like, stop trying to earn grace. Stop trying to earn gifts. You, you can't. There's no way that you can keep pace with God's giving in your life. There's no way that you can put enough chips in the bank in advance to get you through all the hardships and and to account for all of the blessings that God showers upon you. That math just doesn't check out. We cannot keep pace with his goodness toward you and me. We can only overflow with gratitude 
as those who have been richly and abundantly blessed, far beyond what we deserve. And then this is where praise comes in. This is why in worship praise is important. It's absolutely right. It has its place. Uh, we respond to God's goodness with thanksgiving as a response for just how gracious he's been to us. And there's a part of me that wants to think that God is pleased with our gratitude, that he gets some sort of relational benefit or satisfaction from it in a, a non-emotionally needy way. But then I'm forced to recognize that even our gratitude toward God, God seems to evoke for our good and benefit. Science shows us that gratitude is something that's good for us. It's correlated with increased heart health, nervous system regulation. People that are more grateful use fewer sick days. They're more optimistic. They have less anxiety. Gratitude is good for the body. And it's good for the soul. And that's why in our passage today, we're told to continually worship, routinely and habitually, because God knows that it's not a burdensome requirement that he's inviting us into, but it's like Pastor Dion said two weeks ago, that in worship, God wants it to go well with us. God wants to peace us, as Pastor Doug said last week, because God cares about you. And so we're called to embrace the habit of routinely worshiping God. And now admittedly, there are times where worship, we don't always feel excited. It feels like a sacrifice, you know, and that checks out. There's lots of things in life that don't feel good for us or don't feel great in the moment, but which are good for us in the long term, you know. Uh, when that alarm clock rings and it's time to get up and work out, maybe you run or lift or, or you need to go do some burpees, you know, 100%, most of us would rather not be doing that. But good things require effort. And the benefit is often felt later on, maybe in the middle of your lift or, or by the third song. You see, God knows that the routine and habit of worship has a, a cumulative effect on us. And if you've been feeling a little burnt out, struggling with worship, thinking maybe, like, should I retire from worship? Uh, you know, stick it out. Trust God that he is giving even when we don't feel it and that it's adding up to something and that breakthroughs often come through leaning into times of struggle. Faith trusts God's word and obeys knowing that his every desire is to bless you and me. And the amazing thing is, God's not up there going, you know what, your worship, it needs to be bigger and better and more extreme, more passionate. But rather, he says, let your worship be true, authentic and honest. And simply participate. Participate. Because worship is not a spectator sport. Each and every person from up here to backstage in the booth, uh, to the band, to those in the pews, to those in kids' men or student men, everyone has a role, a participatory role to play in the worship of God. Uh, I was in middle school when I first picked up a guitar and began playing for a youth group, you know, and this was the, the 90s. And I was looking back a while ago and I found this, this real gem for you guys to share today. Um, so there you go, a little grainy, but um, I, by the way, I have no idea why my hair is green in this picture. Um, really no idea, I've forgotten. Um, but there it is in the history books. Uh, apparently, when you're rocking out to shout to the Lord, like it's just better when your hair is green, I think. Um, but you know, Sometimes people ask me and they, they go, like, why do you do it? Why do you, why do you get up and, you know, play in worship bands? There really hasn't been a time in my life when I've taken a break since then. And, and why do you do it? And, and you don't get paid. It's not in your job description. There's no expectation. And you know what? I'm at church all the time. Why add more time where I have to be at more rehearsals and, and so forth? And, you know, at first there was a part of me that picking up a guitar, I wanted to be a rock star and, and clearly now that I've achieved that status um, and moved beyond it, 
you know, I don't know that I can quite describe it but I, or explain it, but I know that playing in worship, that singing, that it makes me feel whole, closer to God, in sync with the Holy Spirit. And whether you know how to play an instrument or sing or not, I think this is a universal truth that when we, when we raise our voices together, when we join together as one, that God bonds us closer together and forms us and shapes us as a community in a powerful way. And that checks out in our passage for today. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice. Do good and share with others. That in worship, it's, it's not any longer you or me. It's we. It is us. There's something here. God is pleased to bring us together in worship. He, he knows each and every one of us. He knows we are good for one another. And there's something about worship that compels us toward our fellow man. That's what we've been doing this week with, with Missions Week. It's been the overflow of our worship spreading out into our community. Worship locates us as members of God's family. And it always leads us into relationship with others where the identity God gives us is fully fleshed out, seen, and formed. You see, we tend to think that those sacrifices in the Old Testament, that they were things that individuals did and, and they were sort of a dirge, a, a somber affair. But quite often, the opposite was true. Many of the sacrifices in the Old Testament were given as sacrifices of thanksgiving. There's even a sacrifice called a thank offering. And often these sacrifices resulted in a feast of cooked meat that the family and your friends and neighbors, that everyone would come out for and enjoy together as a community. Because God loves to bring together his people in worship. There's something he gives us when we're together that we cannot get apart. And it's the gift of being able to share God's gifts, to, to practice being the giver and experience the joy that comes from sharing God's blessings and goodness with one another. Not to receive a reward, uh, a reward, but to grow in our own gratitude as we, we widen our perspective and we grasp just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God in its fullness. And so why do we worship it's not to make up for something we've done or left undone, but rather we offer our sacrifice of praise to thank God for what he has done. Thanks be to God. God, we thank you this day for bringing us, calling us by name into this time of worship. God, we thank you Lord, for lifting the burden from us through your son, Jesus. Lord, that you came that we might be free, free from the regulations, free from the sense of obligation, free from trying to do this human thing of earning grace because we never can. Lord, you love us. You created us in your image. You restore us and set us on the path to whole life because it is simply your good pleasure that it might go well with us and we might be people at peace in the love of God. And so God, we thank you. If we have come with bad motivations trying to earn something, if we've felt a sense of obligation, if we've been sensing even, gosh, what... A, what am I getting from this? Do I, do I need to give it up, Lord? We pray that you would pour into us, that you would place your spirit upon our hearts to lean into the joy of your goodness and the gift of being able to share your blessings with one another. Lord, give us a spirit that cannot help but bring that sacrifice of praise and just say thank you, God. Amen.